practice, you can get down to four verses. Yeah. Actually, the reason it took a little longer was I went out in the auditorium and I discovered it was not coming through the sound system like it's supposed to. And I had turned on everything. And uh, I thought, what in the world is going on? So I went up the balcony. I messed with that. And yes, it is coming out over the Internet. So hello to all of you out there who are watching us tonight. Because uh, I can listen on the headphones and find the uh, Internet. Uh, but it wasn't coming over the speakers out there, which means that several other problems would relate to actually recording it on the CD and the tape recorders. And so I ran up to the sound room, fiddled around, found out the problem, got it corrected, and turned it on and came back down. So <laughs> I'm glad you asked, John, because uh, you just realized that what you did was you wasted three minutes of these good people's time here, uh, because that means that the message is still going to be just just as long as it was going to be before, except now you've added three minutes to that time. So they will miss whatever football game is on tonight. <laughs> All right, please take your Bibles and turn with me over to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 22. We're going to try to finish up Resume and Revolution Part 2 tonight and start when I want your opinion, I will beat it out of you. <laughs> Actually, where I got that, that's not original. Uh, someplace in all of my boxes and so on, I suspect I left it back in Alabama. Uh, so it's probably back in Alabama someplace, but I have a gigantic poster. I love this poster. It is, it, it's big, it's like this. And it shows this very nasty looking gorilla on the front that says, when I want your opinion, I'll beat it out of you. And I love that poster. Anyway, so that's the one that I hope we'll get to tonight, but I'm not quite sure we will. We're in Acts chapter 22, verses 1 through 23. Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they had heard he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence, and he saith, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. And also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light, and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise, and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told of all things which are appointed for thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldst hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou? Arise, and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And saw him saying unto me, Make haste, and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I am imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believe on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death, and, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence, unto the Gentiles. And they gave him audience unto this word, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. And 
They cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust in the air. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll help us to understand the hatred, animosity, bigotry, violence, and viciousness against those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's coming here in this country. All around us we see it happening. We see it intensifying. We see it certainly intensifying in other parts of the world, but here even in the United States. And they're throwing the dust in the air and screaming and yelling, away with them, it's not fit for them to live on the earth. Father, we pray for your blessings on the message tonight, that it will reach our hearts and it will transform our lives. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I recall last week as we began the first part of the message, resume and revolution, we learned lesson number one. Lesson number one was a resume may gain you a hearing, and Paul certainly had a resume, but it will not ultimately win a hostile audience. We looked at Paul's resume. But the important thing about the resume is that it at least gets you a hearing. And we talked about the young men who are so eager for going into ministry without ever bothering to go through the dis discipline of training. Too many want to just jump into the ministry without ever submitting themselves to the, the necessary training that is required. Even the apostles themselves had to have three years sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. I told you about a fundamental Baptist church in Texas last week that's offering bachelor's degrees and master's degrees and doctoral degrees, totally unaccredited, not recognized by anybody but them. <laughs> ridiculous, ridiculous kind of thing. The problem is they're holding themselves out as an authority when they have no authority, producing graduates who have fat heads, pride, because they've got a diploma that says they're a doctor of basically nothing. Other people ought to call them doctor because they have a piece of paper that they put up on their wall without having gone through a, a standard of testing, a standard of accountability, a demonstration that they actually know what they're talking about. Paul was a highly trained theologian. He had something to say about that, that business about patting yourself on the back. Second Corinthians 10.7, Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him think this of himself again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ's. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification, not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed, that I may not seem as it would be to terrify you by letters, for his speech, letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and speech contemptible. Let such a one think this, that such as we are in word by letters when we are absent, such will we be also in deed when we are present. For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves, and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. That's what God thinks of the self-patting on the back of people who not have any, any authority, don't have any discipline, haven't had any training, haven't bought, bothered to go through what is necessary to be a faithful steward. We find even in Paul's epistles to Timothy and Titus, he talks about leadership in the church and makes it very clear that these are men who have been trained and men who have the gifts and men who have learned what it means to be under authority before they exercise authority. We've spent some time going over those things in the past, so I'll not go over it again here. But the reason that, that submission to authority is so difficult for some men is because submission requires humility. And their pride in their natural gifts and their pride in their spiritual gifts make them think that they can succeed without the hard work that's required, the discipline required, the quiet humility of listening to the reasoning and teaching of others. They often have an exalted opinion of themselves that may think they know something somebody else doesn't know. That that other group out there doesn't know as much as they know. You know, the disciples had the very best teacher in the world, the very best teacher that ever lived. But he put them through their paces for three full years. Today, three years is the short Master of Divinity degree. A Master of Theology takes four years even after college. A Doctor of Theology takes an additional three years on top of that, seven years after college, if you want to get to that point. The disciples had to have three years, and Jesus was the master teacher. But it took even Jesus three full years to teach the disciples. How much longer should it take a man to go through his training today? As a result, even those ignorant fishermen, Peter and John, had the impressive resume when it says in Acts chapter 4, after they were arrested for having healed the man, 
It says, and they conclude their words with, Neither is there salvation in any other. They're standing before the Sanhedrin. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them. What did they take knowledge of them? They'd read a bunch of books. They'd done an online course. No. They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Proof was in the pudding. Beholding the man that was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. And that's what led us to lesson number two. We looked at lesson number one, but lesson two is you must follow up, and this is the new material tonight, you must follow up your resume with proof of ability. You can have a great resume, but if you don't do anything with it, if you just go around and wave it at people and beat them over the head with it, it doesn't do any good. You must follow up your resume with proof of ability if you want to win your points and convince others of your product. In this case, the product is the gospel. The Apostle Paul used his resume to get the hearing. He's standing up there saying, look, I'm a Jew. I'm a zealous Jew. I persecuted the Christians. I even threw them in prison and made sure they got killed. The, the, the high priest will tell you this. The elders of the people will tell you this. Oh, everybody's listening. He's got a resume. He starts there. But you can't end there. Paul had an impeccable resume as far as his audience was concerned. It's like the advertisements for stocks and bonds often read, past performance is not a guarantee of future success. How many of you ever heard that? <laughs> I know some of you have because you deal with those things. <laughs> okay, past performance is not a guarantee of future success. But did you hear what it said down in verse 14? Verse 14 is present performance based on past experience, not on past performance. Present performance based on past experience and not past performance. Verses 13 and 14 say, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Okay, so they know the resume, but now here's their past experience showing up in present performance. Verse 14, Beholding the man which was healed, standing with them. That's present performance. They could say nothing against it. It's not enough to rest on your laurels. Not enough to say, well, this is what I did in the past. It's, how are you serving Jesus now? When people examine your life now, they're going to look at your testimony now and your life now. They're not going to look at your testimony now and say, well, what did he do 27 years ago? They're going to see how your life now matches with what you're doing and saying now. As my mom used to say, the proof is in the pudding. You can't just talk the talk, you got to walk the walk. It's not enough to know theology. The question is, how does your theology impact your daily life? How has what you know, and you all here know a lot, you've been sitting under sound preaching, some of you, for longer than I will mention, <laughs> This church is 75 years old, and we do have some people here that almost go all the way back there. You've been listening to sound preaching for 50 to 75 years, some of y'all. It's not what you know. The question is, how has what you know transformed your life and made you more like Christ? You know, that's the goal of the Christian life. The goal of the Christian life is not to have Calvin's Institutes memorized. The goal of the Christian life is to become more like Jesus. Yes, you need some knowledge to be able to do that. But if you stop with knowledge, it does nothing but condemn you. To whom much is given from him shall much be required. It's not to whom much is given. It's enough just to know it. This morning I made a point. Your truly believed and truly applied theology will always determine your morality. Samson knew about the living God. He was one of the judges of Israel. He's listed as a hero of faith. 
He knew true theology. He didn't apply it. You have to have truly believed theology. That's right. If you've got the wrong theology, if you've got Mormon theology or Jehovah's Witness theology, it'll end up in all kinds of weird out-to-lunch kind of places. You have to have true theology. That's the foundation. But you have to apply the theology. It has to be true theology, and it has to be true application. And that's what will determine your morality. False theology applied will determine the wrong kind of morality. Look at Mormonism with the plural wives business and with all the weird stuff they have about gods and goddesses having babies in heaven and then sending them to earth for bodies and then becoming exalted like a god and getting up there and becoming one of the gods who has lots of babies and sons of back earth. Sort of this, you know, repetitive cycle and you wonder if that will ever stop. Of course not, it won't. But they don't think that far. They don't think in terms of the judgment that God is going to send and the destruction that's going to come to this earth. Your theology determines your morality. But your theology has to be not only known in your head, your theology has to be applied in your life. You can't say you believe one thing theologically and you've got that over here in a little box and then down here you live like the rest of the world. True theology, truly applied, determines your morality. Raw head knowledge is dangerous. It's dangerous both to you and it's also dangerous to other people. Knowing theology without having it transform your life will make you proud. It will make you more critical of others, especially other believers who don't see eye to eye with you. Oh, I know some people like that. They're ready to jump down my neck every time I walk past them. You'll be quick to attack them. You'll be quick to point out their faults. You'll never cut them any slack. You'll stick up your nose at them and haughtily inform them that they're not as separated as you are. Paul makes that point in 1 Corinthians 8. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity, that is agape love, the word translated charity there is agape love, that's God's kind of love. Charity edifieth, it builds up. That's what edification means. You can have knowledge, and if that's all you've got, and you can have lots of it, what'll it do? It'll puff you up. It'll make you swell up like a balloon. Look, you one of those puffer birds, you know, one of those birds that blows out its neck like this and it turns all red and it struts around, you know, in its courtship dance and all that kind of stuff, trying to look as impressive as it can to the females. Knowledge puffeth up. Now, Paul is not knocking knowledge. Paul had more knowledge than anybody in any church where he preached. He had a lot more knowledge than any of them. But he also knew the danger of it if it was not properly applied. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Verse 2, and if any man think that he knoweth, we're back to knowledge, if he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. In other words, even the people with the greatest amount of knowledge still have a very long way to go. He thinks he has knowledge. He knows nothing yet as he ought to know. And then it gives you the contrast in verse 3. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. God takes notice not of the ones who've got knowledge. God takes notice of the ones who love him. Did you ever stop and think about that? How much do you love God? Or we all say we love God. And we check that one off the box and then we keep on going. How much do you love God? You know, I can remember when um, Judy and I first realized that God had chosen us one for the other. And I loved her deeply. I loved her deeply. You know who I thought about all day long? It's Judy. If you really love God, do you think about him all day long? Is he always in your thoughts as you are about to do something? Lord, I love you. How will this affect our love relationship? How 
how will this affect others that I want you to know about our love relationship and the love relationship they can have with you? It's not enough to know theology, folks. I know a lot of theology. And every day I learn more. I, I study the scripture and I think, boy, I never saw that before. And I've been a Christian for however many years it is, 137 years. Uh, <laughs> I know you all think I'm really old, but I don't have as much gray hair as somebody else that's sitting out there that I won't mention his name at this moment. But <laughs> you get my point. The issue is love. Not the mushy garbage that the world talks about. The sacrificial love of God for us. And who does God take notice of according to verse 3? If any man love God, the same is known of him. He's not impressed with all the theology degrees. He's not impressed with all of our human attainments. What causes him to sit up and note, take notice of us is our love for him. Because that's what transforms our life. That's the point at which your theology is applied to daily living. Your love for God is what swings it out of the realm of arrogant pride and swings it over to humility and humble service to the Savior. It's like the little quote that I put in the bulletin this morning. Some of you may or may not have read that. You know, every week I've been putting little quotes in that have some uh, practical application. And the one this morning said, it's what you learn after you know it all that makes the difference or that counts. <laughs> what you learn after you know it all that counts. Too many of us think we know it all. At that point, you don't know anything. It's what you learn after you think you know it all that counts. Knowledge untempered by love for others Listen carefully. Love untempered, or knowledge untempered by love for others, always destroys. Knowledge untempered by love for others always destroys. Because it wants to take advantage for itself. Biblical agape love for others will always build them up, even if your knowledge is small. Some brand new Christians can be farther ahead in the spiritual life than those who have been grouchy old Christians for 50 years, 60 years, who know all kinds of Bible stuff, who can quote Bible verses. Biblical agape love for others always builds them up, even if your knowledge is small. Loveless knowledge will never approach the weaker brother or less knowledgeable brother gently and try to win them with kindness. If you have knowledge but you don't have love, you'll never approach the weaker brother that way. You'll never approach the ignorant brother that way. You'll never approach the, the weaker brother gently and try to win them with kindness or with reasoned discussion designed to lead them to the truth. Knowledge without love will instead blast them. And then you'll smile smugly and you'll wipe your hands together as you walk away, leaving that brother or sister in a pile of burning ashes. And you'll feel good about it. I showed them. Have you ever known Christians like that? They know all kinds of stuff, and they are ready to criticize at a moment's notice. They are ready to blast you at a moment's notice. Ah, oh, dear people, you'll feel good about it. Your theological knowledge will make you feel proudly superior to those unwashed masses, to all those Attila the Huns. You know, there are plenty of proud theologians who never lift a finger to actually do any of the dirty work that they tell everybody else to do. Jesus talked about that in Matthew chapter 23. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not after their works, for they say and do not. They bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Those were guys who knew theology. Those were guys who'd been to rabbinic school. Those were guys who sat around and discussed how many angels could dance on the head of a pin. 
Those were guys who thought they knew it all. Jesus says, well, they are in positions of authority. And that's the reason that you do what you're told to do. It's like Paul talks about in Romans chapter 13 writing to the Romans who were under the Caesars who were certainly wicked rulers and he tells them to obey those who are in authority he tells them to submit to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake but don't follow their works Jesus said the same thing here in Matthew 23 just remember that kind of pride is a sin of the devil that theological you think the devil knows more theology than you do I bet he does he sure knows a lot more theology than I know. He's been around. He's read the Bible from cover to cover. He's walked in the courts of God. He's heard God himself speak. The devil knows theology. It's not going to get him to heaven. The devil knows who Jesus is. It's not going to get him to heaven. The devil knows everything about all the angelic warfare of the past, all the angelic warfare that's going on today. He's directing it. He knows the theology. He knows where the Christians are located. He knows every little enclave of Christians all over the world. And he's got demons there working hard to defeat them because the demons know theology too and they know where the Christians are weak. And he's proud of it. Pride is a sin that got the devil into trouble, Isaiah chapter 14. But you know what? If you've got that kind of pride, it guarantees that God will shoot you down if you've got that kind of pride, it guarantees that God will humiliate you. I only, I only typed out a few of the verses that deal with that. But let me just give you a few of them. I mean, you already know, I'm sure, Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. If you've got that kind of pride, God guarantees that he will shoot you down. God guarantees that he will humiliate you. Job 40, 11 says, Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath and behold every one that is proud and abase him have you got that kind of pride it's a guarantee that God will humiliate you it's a guarantee that God will abase you that God will shoot you down Job 40 verse 12 look on every one that is proud and bring him low tread down the wicked in their place Psalm 12 3 the Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things you know, that used to be one of the tortures that people would do. Here's a guy that the king was so tired of listening to him talk, he would take and cut out his tongue. And then all the guy could go, and everybody laugh. Psalm 31, 23, O love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Psalm 40, verse 3, Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Psalm 94, 2, Lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth, and render a reward to the proud. Psalm 101, verse 5, Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart will I not suffer. Psalm 119, 21, and I skipped a whole bunch of them that are in Psalm 119. There's a lot that David says about the proud and that, that chapter that deals with the Word of God. And we all think of that when we think of Psalm 119, 176 verses that deal with, with the Word of God. He also talks about the proud, and quite a number of times there, but I'll just read you a couple of those verses. This is verse 21, Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Verse 78 of Psalm 119, Let the proud be ashamed, for they deal perversely with me without a cause, but I will meditate in thy precepts. Psalm 138, verse 6, Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. You know, that leads to the list of things that God hates. Look where pride is listed in this list. Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Now, it's going to tell you what God hates. It's going to tell you what things are an abomination. Number one, a proud look. Number two, a lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that divides with wicked imaginations, feet that be running swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. What was number one? Pride. 
You know, your pride will not only destroy you, your pride will also destroy your family. One of the things that I have seen over more than 40 years of ministry, and it's very sad, I've served in churches in Texas, in Alabama, two different churches here in New Jersey, and I've seen this among Christian men. Your pride will not only destroy you, it will destroy your family. There are many proud Christian men who can't understand why their children rebelled against them, but the scripture makes it plain. Proverbs 15:25. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. I've seen that happen over and over in families where, in particular, though sometimes with the mothers, but in particular where the fathers are proud men. They can't understand why in the world do their children rebel against them? Why in the world do their children reject the gospel? Why in the wor world do their children walk out into the ways of the world? Why in the world do their children disobey them and go off and do all kinds of horrible things? It tells you the Lord will destroy the house of the proud. The house doesn't mean the building. The house means that family. Proverbs 16.5, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. So we've talked about proud actions, the proud doer. We've talked about proud lips and tongue, which the Lord will cut out, that's speech. Now we're talking about the proud attitudes, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Proverbs 16.19, better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Proverbs 21, 4, and high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. You know, God looks at even the hard work of the wicked as sin. <laughs> you think, well, man, I, you know, there are a lot of very diligent people who are very wicked people. God says their work is sin. A lot of criminals are diligent, too. <laughs> you think about the guys who go to all the trouble, for example, to learn how to cyber hack. And then they cyber hack and steal stuff and steal bank accounts and things like that. I mean, they've had to work hard to learn how to do that kind of stuff. I mean, I can hardly even get to my email. <laughs> and, you know, maybe for you it's a lot easier. I mean, not just getting to your email, but doing other stuff online. Even the hard work of the wicked is sin. Proverbs 21, 24, Proud and haughty scorner is his name who dealeth in proud wrath. Proverbs 28, 25, He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. Ecclesiastes 7, 8, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Isaiah 2, 12, For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. God guarantees he will waste you for your pride. Isaiah 13, 11, And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. God doesn't just say, well, it's going to have its effects on you. God says, I hate it so badly that I will personally destroy it. I will personally destroy you for your pride. The judgment of God is against proud nations as well as proud individuals. We see that many times in relation to Babylon, in relation to Assyria, and so on. Let me read you just one and then talk to you about the mercy of God for a moment. Here's God's judgment against some proud nations. One out of Isaiah, one out of Jeremiah, both talking about the same country. We have heard of the pride of Moab. He is very proud, even of his haughtiness, and his pride, and his wrath, but his lies shall not be so. Jeremiah 48, 29. We have heard of the pride of Moab. He is exceeding proud. His loftiness and his arrogancy and his pride and the haughtiness of his heart. You think God said Moab was proud? How many of you think God said Moab was proud in the verses I just read? Are you there? Are you awake? Hello? Well, I had a few hands out there. Okay. The rest of you didn't raise your hands. You weren't listening. No, maybe it was pride. Oh, I don't want to see my hand get raised. Maybe it would show up on the video camera back there. <laughs> you know, I was contemplating those verses and meditating on them. Recently been doing a study in the book of Ruth. And 
Did you know you can come from a proud and arrogant biological or genealogical line? Parents, grandparents, and so on. But it's interesting to know that God can rescue you even if you have that kind of a heritage. Remember that Ruth was a Moabitess. And she is one of the most humble women in Scripture. She's like the Virgin Mary. Oh, pray that if that is your genealogical, biological line, that God rescues you from it. Because that's the kind of thing that passes from generation to generation. All the way back in the days of Abraham and Lot, and Lot's incest with his two daughters, and one of them had a baby and she named him Moab, and the other one named him Ammon. There was some pride going on back there. And it went on for 600 years to the days of Moses, and then it went on for another 300 years to the days of the judges. And God reached down and he pulled a Moabitess out and put her in the line of the Messiah. That's amazing. Because God condemns the proud. We see it there in Isaiah. We see it there in Jeremiah. More from Jeremiah. Jeremiah 13, 15. Hear ye and give ear. Be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. Chapter 50, verse 31. Behold, I am against thee, O thou most proud, saith the Lord God of hosts, for thy day is come, the time that I will visit thee. You may get away with it for a while, but God is going to come. He's going to nail you. Chapter 50, verse 32. And the most proud shall stumble and fall, and none shall raise him up. And I will kindle a fire in his cities, and it shall devour all round about him. God judges the proud. Malachi 4:11 For behold the day cometh that I will burn as an that shall burn as an oven and all the proud yea and all that do wickedly shall be stubble and the day that cometh shall burn them saith the Lord of hosts that it shall leave them neither root nor branch he'll destroy all their offspring he not only destroys their families and we saw that earlier and God guarantees he'll do it your pride affects not only you it affects your family it affects generations to come it means that you won't have generations to come. Yeah, it leaves them neither root nor branch. Luke 151. Here's Mary. He has showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Look at the list of sins in Romans chapter 1. I read it to you this morning, but I hope you may have noticed this. He's describing them, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Paul talks about those who think they know theology but never put it into practice in their lives in 1 Timothy 6.4. He is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words where cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Those are the guys who got the head knowledge but have never applied it by having come in contact with the love of God and then transferring that love to their own lives so that their knowledge benefits other believers instead of using their knowledge to kill people with it. 2 Timothy 3, 2 For men shall be... Here's the last days. This is what we live in. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. James 4, 6 but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. You know, it's interesting. Most of the people that I know who are proud don't see it in themselves. Instead, and this is, this is really interesting, they usually point at humble people and accuse them of being proud. It's weird you think about it long enough, you begin to realize, yeah, I know a situation like that. God gives more grace. Where he, for he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. First Peter 5.5 5. See, this is all the way through the Bible. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble brings us back to what we were talking about, the guys who don't want to go through the discipline of sitting humbly at the feet of someone else and learning. 
In summary, unless the knowledge of the Word of God transforms your life in a very special way, unless the knowledge of God transforms your life to be more like Christ, who had compassion on the ignorant, who had compassion on those who were going out of the way, if your life is not transformed, your theology is empty. Christ dealt, and he dealt with anger and vigor and force against the arrogant know-it-all theologians of his day. They had head knowledge, but they did not have a love for God, nor did they have a love for others. Matthew 9, 13. But go ye and learn what it meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The church today tends to be isolated, not actually reaching sinners. Matthew 12, 7, he says it again. Same book, just three chapters later. But if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. guiltless. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 2, speaking of Jesus, this is how he approaches it. He knows more than you and I do, you know. But did he sit around talking about how much theology he knew? No. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. You see, the character of Christ was compassion on the unwashed masses, not arrogant scorn. Compassion. Do you know how many times it talks about, and I only put down a few of the verses here, how many times it talks about the compassion that Jesus had? Do you have compassion when you look at Camden, for example? Do you have compassion when you look down the street at a neighbor who throws trash on your lawn when they walk by? Matthew 9.36, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Five chapters later, verse 14, chapter 14, 14. Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. Next chapter, chapter 15, 32. Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat, and I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way. Three chapters later, chapter 18, 27. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Verse 33, that's the application in verse 33. Shouldst not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Two chapters later in chapter 20, verse 34, so Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 41, Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. Four chapters later, Mark 5, 14, Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. It's a man who was demon-possessed, who wanted to follow Jesus, who wanted to be with him. Jesus said, No, I've got a job for you. Everybody knows who you were. Everybody knows what you were doing. Everybody knows how you were possessed with demons. Now you go home and tell them how the Lord has had compassion on you. Chapter 6, verse 34. Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were a sheep not having a shepherd and he began to teach them many things. It doesn't say he began to berate them for their ignorance. What did he do? He taught them. He taught them. Many things, it says. Chapter 8, verse 2, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. Luke seven thirteen. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. A woman who'd lost her son. Chapter 10, 33, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Understand, people, this is the application of true theology. We're talking about knowing theology versus knowing theology and doing it. 
the present proof of what you believe. Like Peter and John and the man standing with them, they beheld him and could say nothing against it. It's not past performance. It's present performance of present theology. How does it interact with your life in this world? And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. That's the prodigal son, the wicked, vile, evil prodigal son who took and wasted the father's inheritance. Took everything that he had and he blew it. You know, most dads would say, you no good scoundrel, don't you come back to my house. You're going to try to mooch off of me again? The father had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. First Peter 3, 8, that's how you and I are supposed to be. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. First John 3, 17, but whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? You say you love God? How has it affected the way you live? How has it affected the way that you treat the brethren? Jude one twenty two. How about those who fall into the sin? And of some have compassion, making a difference. Okay, let me give you one important question. Let me give you one important test. We're moving toward the end here. Here's the important question, the important test. Here it is. Has what you have learned theologically, and you've all learned theology. You've got a lot of theology here. You've had theology for 50 to 75 years. Has what you have learned theologically made you kinder, made you more gentle, made you more tender-hearted, made you more patient? Has what you have learned caused the fruit of the Spirit to grow in your life? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. You know the difference between long-suffering and patience? Patience is putting up with the difficult circumstances of life. Long-suffering is putting up with difficult people. Those are two separate words in Greek. Patience deals with hard circumstances. And tribulation worketh patience. Those are the circumstances of life. God develops patience in you by sending you more trouble. But long-suffering are the difficult people that are in your life. Growing in Christ means you develop the fruit of the Spirit which is long-suffering. Goodness. Has what you have learned theologically developed beneficial goodness in your life? There are different kinds of good in the New Testament. Kalos and Agathos, we'll not talk about that right now, but beneficial goodness is what we're talking about here. Not making you more little, prissy little Miss Two Shoes, but beneficial goodness. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Are you walking more by faith now because of what you know theologically, or are you still walking in the flesh, using the ways of the world to accomplish the goals and purposes that you have, or that you think you have, for your life? Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. That's power under control. Meekness is power under control. Temperance. That's self-control. You know the question that I've hammered over and over from the pulpit. So you say you're a Christian. So how has it changed your life? It's not enough to know theology. 
It's how has it made you more like Jesus. You know, I have several relatives on both sides of the family, as I'm sure you do, of varying different degrees, some more distant than others. Degrees of consanguinity and affinity. Now, those of you who know those legal terms know that consanguinity means blood relatives and affinity means relatives by marriage. I've got those relatives. They'll beat your ears off with what they think are astute, learned, and theological sober discussions. But you know they never lift a finger to do anything. They sit around the house all day doing nothing while their wives support their families. They use the most inane excuses. They talk about their weak health, their lack of opportunity. They talk about unfair people. They talk about the national economy. They talk about their busyness in thinking about important things. They talk about the responsibilities that everybody else should be fulfilling, blah, 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 but they never work. The Bible has something to say about them. Look at the first and last verses of the passage out of Proverbs. Seest thou, this is Proverbs 26, beginning in verse 12. Seest thou, man, wise in his own conceit, there is more hope of a fool than of him. The slothful man saith, there is a lion in the way. A lion is in the streets. Boy, what an excuse. I can't go to work today because, you know, there might be a lion wandering around out there. <laughs> oh, brother. Where did he come up with that? Everybody else is going to work. Well, I'll let the lion get them. But, but you know, there's a lion in the street. Lion. You know, the lion might get me. As a door turneth upon his hinges, clink, 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 so doth the slothful turn upon his bed. Clink, 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 clink. The slothful hideth his hand in his bosom. It grieveth him to bring it to his mouth again. Verse 16, the slugger is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. He won't do the work. He's always got an excuse. Let me paraphrase Paul. He puts it a lot more bluntly. Here's the paraphrase. Let the jerk starve to death. Uh, you didn't know Paul said that? It's in 1 Thessalonians 3.10 and following. For even when we were with you, we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. That word disorderly is the word for lazily. Working not at all, but are busybodies. They know their theology. They can argue your ear off. And they're busy poking into everybody else's affairs to see how they can criticize them. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Don't feed them. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. You say, well, yeah, but he must be an unbeliever, right? No, it's not, that's what it says in verse 15. It says, not count him not, not as an enemy. Admonish him as a brother. Yeah, there are Christians that fit that category. They may have the resume, but they've never done anything with it. They've never applied to life. The Apostle Paul applied to life. Peter and John applied to life. They took their theology and put it into shoe leather. That's what we're supposed to be doing. You know, there are many verses in the Old Testament and New Testament dealing with our obligation to provide for the poor related to the righteous poor. Those who have genuine needs through no fault of their own lazy slothfulness. So the question is, and we'll not go over those lots of verses. We've got two minutes to go here. How do you deal with a sluggard fool? Basically, you can't. It doesn't matter what you do. He still thinks he's right. He still has no conviction in his conscience. Proverbs 29, 9, If a wise man contendeth with a foolish man, whether he rage or laugh, there is no rest. You can get mad at him. It doesn't do any good. You can laugh at him. It doesn't do any good. The sluggard fool has seared his own conscience. It doesn't matter whether you laugh at him or get mad at him. He still, still thinks he's right, so you might as well not waste your breath trying to straighten him out. He'll always argue with you. He will always be convinced that you are wrong and he is right. You know, I've learned what to do. Who cares? <laughs> it makes no difference in the whole world. And God will deal with him someday. So you don't need to get apoplexy over it. Now, that was lesson number two. <laughs> Took me longer to get through lesson number two than I thought. But lesson number two is claiming knowledge and ability, and even having knowledge and ability is not the same thing as performance. Paul had both knowledge and ability. Peter and John had both. They were clearly following Jesus, who had both. To be a follower of Christ does not mean merely knowing orthodox theology. It means in practical terms of life, put your money where your mouth is. It means getting up and putting shoe leather to what you know. That brings us to lesson three. 
and it looks like we're going to have to talk about our true resume next week because your resume and my resume all have things in them that we are not proud of. If our whole resume, that is, our whole life story were known to everybody, there are things in our resume that we're not proud of. How did Paul deal with that? Paul had some things in his resume for which he was not proud. He, in fact, mentions them in public how he killed other Christians. What do you do with those things? Well, we'll pick that up there next week. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We pray that you will give us the humility of Christ, that our knowledge will be reflected in the way that we live, the transformed life, the life that is willing to stand up and be counted, the life that is unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the life that knows that all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And yet, it doesn't matter because we have to give an account to the one who has shown mercy and compassion to us while we were ignorant and out of the way, while we were a sheep having no shepherd, wandering and lost in the wilderness, while we were part of the stinking, huddled masses, and you reached down and plucked us as brands from the burning. Father, give us the compassion of Jesus. Cause us to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Cause our knowledge to result not in arrogant pride, but as we love God, and you recognize those who are loved by you or love you, that as we love God, our lives will be swung over to the character of Christ. And that our knowledge then will be applied in the most articulate and accurate possible ways, so that others might know him and love him too. Father, we've covered many different subjects tonight, trying to tie together what's going on with the Apostle Paul as he stands before the crowd. They give him a hearing. They don't want his message when he gets to the point. But it's gained him a hearing. And he was not ashamed of his resume because he was living his resume in time present. Not talking about all that he'd done in the past. Time present. Father, make us a people who follows you, who follows Jesus, who reflects Jesus today, tomorrow, and every day that lies in the future. For we pray these things, and we pray that it would be with humility, not pride, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is hymn number 3.